freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Hello, dear listeners. This is Nico Perino, and this is So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. For today's candid conversation, we're talking sex. They say sex sells, so let's see if it can sell the Constitution. Our guest today is University of Chicago law professor Jeffrey R. Stone. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Professor Stone is a titan in the free speech world. His First Amendment class at the University of Chicago Law School is among the school's most popular classes, and he was the chair of the school's Committee on Freedom of Expression that in 2015 released the committee's famous Report of the Committee on Freedom of Expression, which in our world is more popularly referred to as the Chicago Statement. If you're unfamiliar with the Chicago Statement, it promises those at the University of Chicago, quote, the broadest possible latitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn, close quote. Portions of the statement have gone on to be adopted or endorsed by at least 17 other university or faculty bodies across the country, including at schools like Princeton, Purdue, and Johns Hopkins. But that's not what we're here today to speak with Professor Stone about. As I said, we're talking sex. And last month, Professor Stone published his book, Sex and the Constitution. The book is a 700-page tome tackling, well, sex and the Constitution. Perhaps Professor Stone had this book in mind when he wrote that the University of Chicago provides the broadest latitude to write. Because this book is a tour de force that extends all the way back to the ancient Greek and Romans in its attempt to explain how sex came to be legislated in America. I met up with Professor Stone earlier this month while he was in New York City on his book tour. We sat down to discuss the portions of his book dealing specifically with the regulation of sexual expression. Anthony Comstock, obscenity, pornography, new dancing, this podcast has it all. So please, sit down, get comfortable. We're about to have the talk about sex and the Constitution. Professor Stone, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this book, uh, just released last month, Sex and the Constitution, is pretty comprehensive. And you write in the beginning that it was the first major research project uh, that you ever embarked upon where you didn't really have a clear sense of where it was headed. So why did you just start decide to write the book in that case? Well, as you know, I mean, normally when an academic writes a book, it's, it's the end product of a long period of, of research and doing articles about the subject and so on. In this instance, it was just a matter of curiosity. I mean, I was intrigued by the fact that the Supreme Court had gotten increasingly involved in issues relating to sex as a constitutional matter, um, on obscenity and contraception and abortion and, and gay rights and so on. And I began to wonder, well, what would the framers have thought about this? How much would this have shocked them or not shocked them? Um, not that I'm an originalist, but I was just curious. And so I began thinking it would be interesting to write a book to try to address that question. And then as I began to delve into that, I realized that I knew much less than I thought I knew, uh, both about the, the world of the framers, but also about the, the, the period leading up to that, um, as well as the period uh, since the framing of the Constitution with respect to these issues um, before the Supreme Court got involved. So it was really a, a curiosity-driven project where I wanted to find things out that I didn't really have much of a sense of. You said that the laws governing sexual behavior in America are deeply bound with religious belief and tradition. What do you mean by that? Because the popular conception in America is that we have this separation of church and state. Well, we're supposed to have a separation of church and state, um, but the practical reality is when one looks at the history of uh, where these laws come from uh, in our nation, uh, it actually becomes increasingly clear that these laws were driven very much by uh, religious forces in society um, that sought to impose their faith upon others who do not share that faith. 
Um, and that is something which I think directly threatens the principle of separation of church and state. Um, courts have had a hard time dealing with it because the courts don't like invalidating laws because they believe the motivation of the legislature is inappropriate. Um, and so that's partly what creates the, the difficulty in sorting out how to deal with religious motivations of the laws. But I think the, the statement that these laws derive almost entirely from very strong religious m movements that were intended to do something which the framers would have um, not been appreciative of uh, is, is pretty clear. Yeah, and I want to get into that uh, religious motivation for some of these laws, particularly the Comstock Act. Uh, which is a large portion of your book. But before I do that, it's important to recognize that your book, Sex and the Constitution, isn't just about free speech issues. Um, actually, only a couple chapters deal with free speech issues. Uh, other chapters in your book deal with uh, the right to abortion, to gay marriage, uh, these so-called, as you put it in the prologue, unenumerated rights. Um, I want to talk for our listeners a little bit about unenumerated rights, um, because those of us who are in the First Amendment community don't typically have to deal with them. Uh, it's not really the uphill challenge that those advocating for uh, gay rights or for abortion rights have to deal with. So what are enumerated rights and why don't First Amendment advocates really worry about them? Well, the when the Constitution was first um, drafted, um, it did not, of course, include a Bill of Rights, which is why they are amendments. And uh, one of the objections to the original Constitution when it was put up for ratification was the fact that it did not include a Bill of Rights. And one of the reasons why the original drafters did not include a Bill of Rights was the concern that if they listed a series of rights in the Constitution, um, that would give rise to the inference that they were the only rights that the Constitution was intended to protect. Um, and this was a concern for them. And one of the ways to avoid that was simply not to enumerate the rights in the first place. Um, but in light of the pushback that they got um, when the Constitution was up for ratification, um, the original framers promised to go back and to uh, add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. And in doing so, one of the first 10 amendments was the Ninth Amendment. Um, and the Ninth Amendment, which was designed specifically to address this issue, uh, basically provided that the enumeration of rights in the Constitution is not to be taken to, to deny or to bridge other rights held by the people. And so the idea was that these first, eight, these first eight amendments guaranteeing freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures and freedom from cruel and unusual punishment and so on uh, were not meant to be exhaustive. And that the framers understood that there were going to be other rights, that there were in fact already other rights that they hadn't listed, either because they hadn't recognized that they'd ever be threatened or because they knew the world would change, society would evolve, and things would come to light uh, that had not been apparent at that time. Uh, and so the idea of unenumerated rights was ultimately central to the, to the vision of the framers. And First Amendment uh, advocates uh, tend not to think about those rights because there is, of course, an explicit guarantee of the freedom of speech and press in the Constitution, and all they need to worry about are those words. And this, this idea of unenumerated rights, how do the courts typically deal with them because they're unenumerated and judge bork famously said that it was just an ink blot on the constitution and that judges some more or less ignore it well the court has tended to be reluctant to ex get in explicitly to the business of relying upon the ninth amendment um, it tends to use other provisions as well so often it is relied upon substantive due process uh, as a way of um, identifying uh, additional uh, constitutional rights. Uh, but it doesn't really matter whether they use the, the, the rubric of, of substantive due process or whether they use the Ninth Amendment. Um, fundamentally, the challenge they face, and it's a serious challenge, is how do you know what those rights should be? Constitutional interpretation even when there's a constitutional provision, is extremely difficult because of the vagueness in which these guarantees are stated. Um, you know, what is the freedom of speech? What is equal protection of the laws? What is due process of law? What's an unreasonable search? Um, those are not self-defining terms, um, and nor is uh, unenumerated rights. But the framers tend to look to our traditions, uh, to, the, to the values that have been deeply embedded in the Constitution, um, to the respect that our society has given to certain um, aspects of human behavior and relied upon those and then asked whether uh, certain laws at any given point in time are consistent with those uh, fundamental uh, beliefs and, 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 and assumptions about what our society stands for. And that's actually an interesting point. You said they're the freedom of speech. And in your book, you, you grapple with this concept because the First Amendment, of course, famously says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. 
Um, some people, some justices, for example, Hugo Black, who you deal with in your book, believe that that took that to the, took that to mean literally that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But you argue that there are other interpretations of the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law abridging this concept of free speech. And the difficulty comes in when you're defining this concept. And how has this informed the the discussion that you have in the book, and then just the discussion of the First Amendment as a whole. Well, first of all, even Hugo Black, who insisted that he was an absolutist about the First Amendment, wasn't. Um, Hugo Tinker, Black, for example, he was right, the center. Right. Uh, Hugo Black often have upheld restrictions on speech if they were of a certain sort. For So, for example, content-neutral restrictions um, he often upheld, which meant he was defining the freedom of speech in a way that, that did not give absolute protection to all aspects of speech. Um, but the problem, and Holmes really made the point most dramatically um, in uh, 1919 in the, in the Schenck case, uh, and where he gave the hypothetical of the false cry of fire in a, in a crowded theater. And the purpose of that hypothetical was to demonstrate, really once and for all, that the First Amendment can't literally be taken literally. Um, that it would be crazy to say that the false cry of fire in a crowded theater is constitutionally protected. Um, and therefore, what Holmes did is to, is to understand that the challenge is to figure out what is the freedom of speech that may not be abridged. And the framers themselves, of course, did not believe that the freedom of speech was absolute. Uh, there were laws about defamation, for example, at the time of the framing that the, that the founders of our Constitution didn't believe were unconstitutional. Um, and so that, that became the central challenge of interpreting the First Amendment. Um, and it is a very difficult one, just like deciding what are the unenumerated rights, uh, f- figuring out what is the freedom of speech that may not be abridged has been an ongoing challenge. And it's directly relevant to the, to the inquiry of the book, uh, particularly on the question of obscenity, um, because uh, historically it was understood and, and asserted that obscenity was not within the freedom of speech, uh, protected by the First Amendment, in the same way that at different times the court has said the threats, true threats, are not protected by the First Amendment, or uh, various forms of defamation are not within the freedom of speech, and so on. Um, but basically, the court has wrestled with the question not so much of whether obscenity is protected by the First Amendment, just as Black and Douglas took that position, um, but basically no other justice ever has. Uh, but the fundamental question that the court has grappled with is, even assuming that something called obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment, well, what is obscenity? How do you define it? And that's, of course, been a question that has plagued the court um, at least since 1957. Well, it's fitting that we're actually in New York City because this discussion surrounding obscenity or mis- obscene materials really started in New York City around 1815 or or early part of the 19th century. Um, Because prior to that, as you write in your book, that the the government mostly had laws against religious heresy or seditious libel. Um, But then there was a movement movement led by the Young Men's Christian Association, more popularly known as the YMCA, uh, in the 1840s to go after what they saw as New York's carnal showcase of the Western world. And these efforts were led by Anthony Comstock, who, as anyone in the First Amendment community knows, sort of is the leader of the charge against obscenity. Can you talk about those early movements and how this effort to grapple with obscenity took hold in America? So one thing that um, people forget or don't know uh, that is important to understand is that although sexual expression and often very um, explicit sexual expression, was quite common in the American colonies and in the United States at the time that the Constitution was ratified, Um, there were no laws against obscenity in the United States. And such expression was routinely uh, bought and sold and and possessed and displayed um, without any legal constraint whatsoever. Um, And so the world in which the framers lived um, had no concept of obscenity uh, and regarded sexual expression um, as simply the part of free speech that presumably uh, was protected by the First Amendment, although they never had direct occasion to think about or to talk about the question. Um, laws against obscenity first came into existence in the United States in a few states um, in the early years of the, of the 19th century, um, and the first obscenity prosecution in the United States ever was in 1815. Um, And that was during the beginning of the Second Great Awakening, during a a religious uh, revival uh, in which religious religious groups reacting to the Enlightenment, um, which they felt went much too far, uh, attempted to put uh, religious restrictions on individual behavior. Um, That included things like uh, blasphemy prosecutions, um, 
trying to prohibit the delivery of mail on Sundays, and instituting uh, laws against uh, this thing called obscenity. Um, but those, those laws were relatively few and far between until um, really after the Civil War, um, when the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, um, teamed up with Anthony Comstock uh, to begin a really um, furious movement to try to uh, eliminate uh, obscenity anywhere in the United States, and ultimately succeeding so that by the end of the 19th century, um, every state in the nation um, had laws prohibiting obscenity, and the federal government had laws prohibiting obscenity, and those laws were extremely broadly defined. So it was nothing like what we might today think of as obscenity, which has almost no meaning, um, or even what in 1957, uh, when the Supreme Court finally decided the Roth case, would have thought about as obscenity. But basically, any uh, written matter that made any reference whatsoever to sex, even if it was a medical journal dealing with the issue of contraception, um, or even if it was a, a story that used a word like penis, um, that was deemed automatically to be obscene. And the driving force behind this um, was the, the fear that such expression would corrupt the morals of individuals. And they were especially concerned about young people, um, fearing that uh, exposure to such material would excite the imaginations and the desires of young people, um, but also, in particular, and interestingly, women. Um, there was a, a real concern that women having this um, strand of personality deeply built into their um, their self, uh, exemplified by Eve as a tempstress, uh, that women uh, could not be trusted with sex, that women had a natural tendency um, to be seductive and uh, to behave in ways that were sexually sinful, and that to, to allow women to be exposed to sexual uh, material would lead to their infidelity, uh, would lead to their premarital sex, um, and so women like, like youth were thought to be especially susceptible to this sort of material. And some of the first materials that that the government or even private individuals, because YMCA had a chief inspector in Anthony Comstock, and it was almost this extra legal pursuit of obscenity. Uh, some of the things they went after were medical journal, journals, as, as you said. What else? Well, the, the, first of all, as to the private act, actors here, um, even when the laws were enacted, for the most part, the police didn't make a high priority of enforcing these laws. Um, they had never been around before, um, and they had, other, they had other things that they wanted to devote their attentions to. So the YMCA, and with, with Anthony Comstock's uh, great efforts and his creation of uh, organizations dedicated to what he called the suppression of vice, um, they went around and they basically identified uh, those who sold what they deemed uh, pornographic materials, um, and they then brought those materials to the police, and they put pressure on the police, public pressure on the police, to enforce. So in that way, the, these private organizations and leaders had a powerful impact on the enforcement of the laws by actually doing the legwork of the of the police, and then effectively shaming the gov government officials into enforcing the laws after they presented them with the materials. So in the early years, um, uh, medical journals uh, that talked about uh, contraception were an early uh, target of, of these, um, these efforts. Um, and uh, uh, pamphlets and magazines that, that told stories about um, sometimes real people. So one um, famous incident involved um, a, a journal that uh, published a letter uh, that revealed a, I assume, true story um, about a woman who had had um, a very difficult childbirth that put her into a, a medically precarious position um, and who was told by her doctors not to have um, sex for an extended period of time while she healed. And her husband forced himself upon her, um, and she died as a result of the forced sex. And the letter to the editor basically described this story, and in the course of describing it said, you know, if we would punish a, a husband for killing his wife with a, with, a, with a knife, then why shouldn't we also punish a husband for killing his wife with a penis? And because the story talked about sex, and because it used the word penis, even though it was a true story that was designed to um, educate people about the dangers in this situation, um, the, the publisher was prosecuted for violating these laws because he published something which had anything to do with sex. And this idea of obscenity, it wasn't until later that courts started to grapple with a work as a whole to see if it had artistic or scientific or literary value. Early on, they relied on English common law, this, uh, this case, Regina v. Hicklin, which concerned um, 
the distribution of a pamphlet describing sexually explicit, explicit questions that priests asked women during confession. And it defined obscenity, if I'm not mistaken, as thoughts of a most impure and libidinous character. Right. So the original definition of obscenity that came from the English case um, basically said that if a work contained um, anything, including a single word or a single image, um, that was seen to be uh, sexually arousing, uh, to the most vulnerable members of society, that is, in particular, children, um, then it was obscene and was criminal. Um, and therefore, you know, even if you had a novel that had um, one sentence in it that talked about sex in a way that was think- thought to be impure, the entire novel would automatically be deemed uh, pornographic and, and prohibited. And that was the way the law uh, existed until the 1920s, uh, when not, when some federal judges and state judges, including Learned Hand, uh, who later became, uh, who actually earlier had already become a, a hero uh, to First Amendment advocates, uh, Learned Hand and other judges began interpreting these statutes, not as a constitutional matter, because uh, it was still generally understood that, that whatever obscenity was, it wasn't protected by the First Amendment, uh, but they began to interpret the meaning of these words like obscenity and pornographic and degrading and sexual and arousing and so on uh, in a more limited way. Uh, and one of the things they began doing is to t- talk about the whole, uh, the whole work standard, essentially saying that it was not enough that one word or one passage might be arousing to the most vulnerable members of society, but the work as a whole had to be evaluated in order to decide whether it should be deemed obscene. And so it was in the 1920s then that a few judges began for the first time to construe these statutes in a narrower way, um, although the First Amendment issue still never really got taken seriously until the Supreme Court addressed the question in 1957. In Roth v. United States, correct? Correct. Um, where it set out more or less a, a three-pronged test to grapple with the obs- issue of obscenity and the First Amendment. It said that the the, the material must appeal to a prurient interest, uh, that the average person implying contemporary community standards would find it to be obscene, and that the contents must be judged as a whole and in context. Uh, and also that the work has to have no redeeming social value which was the way Brennan, who wrote the opinion, justified the conclusion that obscenity could be deemed outside the First Amendment, uh, a critical part of his reasoning was that the speech had no redeeming social value. And so that was more or less, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert here, but the high watermark for judging obscenity in the United States, because later in, in 1973 in Miller v. California, they got rid of that, that last standard, this no, no redeeming social value standard. Right. So from 1957 to 1973, um, the court wrestled with the problem of, of defining obscenity. And they could not agree upon, five justices could not agree upon a single definition. And this created a period of some chaos because uh, in part as a result of the ambiguity, uh, it was difficult for anyone to know whether any particular work was obscene because there was no single standard that captured the support of five justices of the Supreme Court. You had Black and Douglas saying that there was no such thing as obscenity. You had Brennan and several other justices adopting the standard that he refined over time in Roth. You had a couple of other justices who said there were different standards for states than for the federal government, um, and so on. And so the court uh, took to doing something um, which was, um, in two ways, very problematic. One is it realized that it was the only body in the United States, given this confusion it had created, that could decide whether a work was obscene. It became the high court of obscenity, as Robert, Justice Robert Jackson called it. Exactly. And so basically every uh, significant obscenity prosecution in the United States um, had to wind up being decided by the Supreme Court. And that meant the justices had to spend an inordinate amount of time uh, watching movies that were dirty, uh, trying to figure out, applying their various standards, whether uh, five of them found it to be obscene or not to be obscene. Uh, And this was obviously a very awkward time for the justices um, and even for some of the law clerks. Um, Justice uh, Harlan had lost his eyesight uh, late in his career, and one of the responsibilities of his law clerks was to sit next to him during these movies and to whisper to him in great detail exactly what was happening on the scene, uh, on the screen. And this was not something that many law clerks were very comfortable with. 
Um, but in any event, what the court took to doing was basically having all nine justices uh, watch these movies, although Justices Black and Douglas tended not to, because as Black put it, well, if I want to see a dirty movie, I'm perfectly happy to pay for it. <laughs> um, but basically, the other seven would watch these movies, and then they, they would cast their votes, and then they would simply write a one-line decision, which simply said the movie was obscene or not obscene, uh, without giving really any explanation at all. And that was not an acceptable state of affairs. Everyone knew it was an unacceptable state of affairs. And when Warren Berger became president, one of his became chief justice, one of his first priorities was to solve this problem and to create a new and what he hoped would be clear definition of obscenity that would make the, this area of the law more manageable. But it wasn't really more clear because you're getting rid of this this prong dealing with um, social values and eliminating. So you're dealing with average person contemporary standards. You're dealing with the work taken as a whole, prurient interest. Um, if it describes sexual content in a patently offensive manner, it, would, it could be held to be obscene, and it lacks serious artistic, political, and scientific value. And is this more or less where we're, and we're st- we are still are today so, from a legal perspective? Right. So, so Berger's hope was that by redefining obscenity, he could give uh, he could accomplish two goals. One, he could get the court out of the business of having to decide, given in specific cases, whether any particular work was or was not obscene. Um, and on that, he more or less succeeded. Um, and second, um, it was to uh, broaden the definition of what could be deemed obscene. Because between 1957 and 1973, during the sexual revolution, um, there was a, a continuing uh, increase in the availability of more and more explicit, sexually explicit material. Um, things like Playboy magazine and, and, and movies became more sexually explicit. And people like Warren Berger... Um, were horrified at this, and they therefore wanted to rein this in. And so a a key part of the change in the definition that Berger adopted in Miller v. California was to say that the standard is not that a work is obscene only if it has no redeeming social value, but it's obscene if it it lacks serious uh, social value. And the idea, therefore, was to to expand what could be deemed obscene. Um, But what happened in the years since then is that technology basically took over. And that with the advent of first um, VCRs and then cable um, and then ultimately the internet, um, two things happened. Uh, One is that the ability of uh, public officials and prosecutors um, effectively to prosecute sexual material um, became more and more daunting because the material became more and more pervasive um, and it was just... uh, impossible for the prosecutors to devote the resources that were necessary to actually um, prevent this sort of material from being available to people. And second is as this material became available to people, community standards um, evolved. And as the moralist feared, uh, with exposure to obscenity, uh, those standards, uh, the moralist would say, eroded and people became less shocked by more and more sexually explicit material to the point where it became next to impossible to get a jury to convict anyone for um, distributing uh, even highly sexual material. And so we've now reached a point where prosecutions for obscenity are virtually non-existent. Um, The federal government has not engaged in in prosecutions for obscenity now for several decades, um, and most states have basically given up on the matter, uh, and any of us can get on the internet without any difficulty whatsoever uh, the most egregiously an explicitly sexual material that anyone could imagine. Um, and so for all practical purposes, the idea of obscenity as a way of preventing consenting adults from obtaining access to sexually explicit material has become a vestige of the past um, and is really no longer uh, meaningful. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't still restrictions on what you can see on over-the-air television um, and, and in movies uh, where there, there is both in, in television, the FCC still controls what ABC and NBC and CBS can broadcast, although it doesn't control what can be on cable and it has nothing to do with what can be on the Internet. Um, and, um, and there are other areas, like in public places, there are limitations because of the desire to protect, protect children and unconsenting adults. But basically, the, the old notion that even consenting adults should not be allowed to have access to sexually explicit material is now a thing of the past. 
Yeah, and you write in your book that more than a third of adults visit an adult website every month. It's become almost so ubiquitous that prosecuting for it is impossible, but that hasn't stopped some administrations, not recent ones, but some administrations from trying to go after obscenity because it still has this cachet amongst some of the uh, voting blocs in America. Um, you but, talk- even, but even for them, it has been more a, um, a public relations ploy. Mm. So even if you go back to, to Bush two, for example, um, when he was elected, he said that he was going to he's going to reinstitute these prosecutions. Uh, but ultimately, there were fewer prosecutions of obscenity under Bush two than there were under Clinton, and and the, the number was tiny. Uh, and basically, what's happened is, is the federal government and most of the states have shifted their attention away from the doctrine of obscenity and towards the concern about child pornography. Um, and that's where they use their limited resources um, to attempt to do the best they can to prevent child pornography, giving up effectively on anything that could be deemed ordinarily obscene. Is the doctrine of obscenity pretty much a mute constitutional point at, at, at this juncture? It's moot, at least in the context of preventing consenting adults from obtaining access to sexual material on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, with respect to other venues, is that a cultural development or is that really a legal development? Is Miller still good law? Miller is still good law, but two things have happened: contemporary community standards have evolved to the point where virtually nothing um, violates contemporary community standards, and so even the most extreme sexual be- behavior today, which would surely have been obscene in 1973 would be regarded by jurors as, well, I've seen that. That's no big deal. Um, and, and in any event, if you, the only thing you can prosecute is, is, the, is stuff that's so extreme and so off the charts, it's really not even worth bothering um, because nobody really at that point thinks it makes all that much difference. Um, and so prosecutors have just given up on it. And as a practical matter, therefore, if the question is, do consenting adults now effectively have a right to obtain, at least on the Internet, access to anything they want that is sexual other than child pornography, the answer is yes. So when we, as First Amendment advocates, are talking about the exceptions uh, to the First Amendment, are we more or less stuck with obscenity being one, despite the fact that it's been more or less muted out by this contemporary community standards? Or do you think that the Supreme Court will one day take up an obscenity case and find that obscenity isn't outside the bounds of the First Amendment? Um, It could conceivably... It is still clearly the law that obscenity is outside the bounds of the First Amendment as a matter of, of black liberal law. Um, and I don't know what the court would do today if it were to take a case. Um, so let's, let's assume, for example, that Judge Gorsuch is confirmed today, I guess. Um, and let's assume that uh, one of the more liberal justices on the court for reasons of health or otherwise, leaves the court in the next couple of years, and Donald Trump gets to appoint another uh, Judge Gorsuch. Um, And so now you have a Supreme Court with uh, Roberts, Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Gorsuch. Um, They would no doubt believe that there should be a doctrine of obscenity and that it should have bite. Um, I think they would also understand as a practical matter that trying to enforce such a doctrine on the Internet is pointless. And that, yes, you could say there's a doctrine, but they're not stupid, and they would recognize it would accomplish nothing. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't say that, that, that um, for example, the, the government can regulate sexual material on cable, which right now it can't regulate, um, at least not the way it can television, over-the-air television or radio, um, because cable is more manageable, right? It's a more constrained um, a venue. And so they might say that um, you can regulate it on cable and that there are standards that would apply, but it would still, you still have the problem that contemporary community standards of what is it that is so patently offensive that it could be deemed obscene have become so extreme. I mean, there have been cases that have been brought by some state prosecutors where a local um, uh, video store uh, is selling stuff that's ex- extremely, uh, grossly, violently sexual. Um, and, and on a few occasions, juries have convicted uh, in recent years, um, in those circumstances. But the material is, again, unbelievably extreme. And even then, the jurors have been very divided in these cases. So I'm, this is not a high priority as a practical matter yeah. for the government. So where where it is a more, is a greater priority is when this material is becomes available to children or unconsenting adults. So we're talking billboards on public streets uh, through uh, broadcasting on radio and, and the networks. Um, 
you talk in your book, you, you have this interesting discussion that I want to explore with you um, about public nudity laws. And you say that um, laws against public nudity are similar to laws against speeding and wiretapping because they're not directed at speech. Um, you write, quote, they are designed to protect individuals from the offense of seeing naked people in public. And, and I want to push back on this a little bit because it seems like Comstock could have rewritten that sentence to say something like laws against t-shirts saying fuck the draft are designed to protect individuals from the offense of seeing vulgarities in public. So how do you draw that distinction? So the distinction is that there's a well-accepted doctrine under the First Amendment that a law that itself is not directed at speech um, is not going to be held to violate the First Amendment because it has an incidental effect on speech except in very extraordinary circumstances. There are a couple of cases where the court has done that where the impact on speech was extremely dramatic. And um, public nudity laws are not about restricting speech. If people want to go walk down Central do Central Park or sunbathe in Central Park in the news in the nude, they're not speaking. They're just engaging in sunbathing. And it's not in, in either in their head or their intention or their actions are they expressing themselves or intending to express themselves. Although I think New York allows for public nudity well, in they, Times Square. They can, yeah, local they, law. Right. The, that law doesn't there's nothing that requires a ban mm-hmm. on public nudity. The point is that public nudity in and of itself, like speeding, is not speech. Now somebody might speed because they're protesting speed limit laws. Mm-hmm. Right? Um uh, or somebody might, you know, might might um, uh, beat somebody up because they're they're protesting that person's views. But the fact is that laws against beating somebody up, laws against being nude in public, laws against speeding, uh, those laws are not directed at speech, and therefore they fall within the incidental effect doctrine. And so, if somebody walks down, um, uh, walks through Central Park naked because they're protesting the anti-nudity laws, they are they are engaged in speech, but the law that they're prosecuted under is not about speech. And in the same way that a person speeding, who says, I'm speeding because I'm protesting the speeding laws, uh, they're not going to be able to challenge the constitutionality of the speeding laws, um, which has only an incidental effect on someone who's speeding as speech. So that's a, that's a generally accepted doctrine. It's, it's applied largely across the boards. And so if somebody was, su- was, was, was um, sunbathing in Central Park and, and n- public nudity was prohibited, they could be prosecuted for that. And in the same way, someone who marches through Central Park in the nude as an expressive activity could be punished under that statute, and that would be okay. Um, and one can argue that that's a good or a bad doctrine, but it's well accepted, and um, for the most part, it makes perfect sense. So the issue that arose with respect to the public nudity question was, was nude dancing. Um, in um, in a bar, uh, and the Supreme Court held that the public nudity law applied to nude dancing in a bar. That was what the state concluded its statute did, and therefore that applying the public nudity law to the nude dancing in the bar was simply an incidental effect of the general public nudity law. And uh, Justice White wrote a a dissenting opinion in the case, which basically argued that, no, this is different, because in this situation, the purpose of public nudity laws, he said, is to protect children and non-consenting adults from being exposed to nudity and and in in ways that, that they should not have to be exposed to if they don't wish to. But in the bar, there are no um, children and there are no non-consenting adults, and because anyone who enters the bar knows there's going to be nude dancing Uh, because it's a big sign outside the bar that says that. And so White argued that you can't justify this as an incidental effect of an ordinary public nudity law because the the concerns of those laws are simply irrelevant to what's happening inside this particular bar. And um, so his argument was that this is not really an incidental effect. Here, the only justification for punishing the public dancing in the nude is that the dancing itself is seen to be problematic, and that's directed at speech, he says. Um, and Justice Scalia wrote a famous concurring opinion in which he uh, objected to White's reasoning, uh, in which Scalia said basically, no, 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 the, the reason for, for prohibiting public nudity is not about protecting unconsenting adults and children. It's that public nudity um, and exposing oneself to strangers in the nude um, is immoral. And that doesn't matter whether the people you're exposing yourself to uh, want you to be exposed to them or not. Um, that itself is immoral. 
And that, that, that has left open the kind of interesting question of whether this judgment about what Scalia thinks is immoral is it in itself a, a justification for prohibiting speech um, in, in the way in which it was prohibited in the, in the public uh, dancing cases. Yeah, because that seems to jive with what Comstock, Brennan, and Helms were saying that, you know, obscenity laws are necessary. Or you argue that they, they were against obscenity because it made them squeamish, that it was immoral, and Scalia is projecting that same rationale against exactly. public nudity laws. Right. Even apart from the unconsenting adult and the, and, and the mm-hmm. minor, that basically the very fact of public nudity, whether it's in a, a bar or it's on a, on a beach, is essentially like obscenity. And it has the effect of, of creating lust, and that's something the state has a legitimate interest in, in avoiding. Yeah. And w- but when I think of public nudity, <laughs> and I realize I'm belaboring this point because I just think it's an interesting question. Um, I think that what people choose to wear or not wear is in itself an expressive activity. Um, so, but I can see the justification for public nudity laws from the perspective of unconsenting adults, but not a blanket ban on public nudity because it's immoral or squeamish. Um, you know, Philadelphia, for example, has this famous uh, nude bike race. New York has local laws that allow for nudity in public. And I, and I think the rationale is that the nudity can be an expressive activity. Um, but I see the argument coming in where you have unconsenting adults involved, right. whereas well, you speeding, don't when... Speeding could be an expressive activity, too. That, that doesn't make... That's a good point, yeah. Right. I mean, the fact that it... The question is not whether it's an expressive activity. The question is whether the law is is about the fact that in some cases it's expressive. But speeding can have a harmful effect that's not a subjective standard such as seeing someone naked, which our Puritan instinct tell us is immoral or obscene or whatever. Speeding can result in empirically um, higher uh, numbers of deaths on highways. So what about noise? So mm-hmm. basically, the state says, oh, "Well, you, know, you, you can't make noise in a residential neighborhood after ten o'clock at night," um, and uh, and the, and I want to make noise because that's my way of communicating. Yeah, right. And the state says, "No, you can't do that." And the state's interest is, "Well, noise is upsetting to people," mm-hmm. right? And you presumably say that's enough of a state interest. Yeah, right. And so this, the government would argue that the, the offense that people take to seeing people nude is sufficiently um, harmful to them that the state can protect that in the same way that it can regulate noise. Yeah, well, it just it, it harkens back to this idea. I think I guess the subjective word of offense is is what bothers me because after reading your book and seeing how Comstock and his crew uh, engaged in their Comstockery, which is a <laughs> a word that you introduced in the book, and I just got a good laugh at, use the same argument more or less for obscenity. Um, but I can see how interests in nuisance. The difference laws. is Comstock was explicitly regulating speech, mm-hmm. right? The argument in the public nudity context is you're not interested in whether it's speech or not. That's completely incidental. We don't want people to be nude in public, period. Mm-hmm. And we don't care whether they're speaking or they're sunbathing. It makes no difference to us. So it's not directed at speech. That's the argument. That's why the speeding analogy is better than the obscenity analogy here, because the regulation is simply not directed at the fact that some people do it for speech purposes. The government doesn't care. They just don't want nude people walking around. Yeah. Okay. Well, I won't belabor that point long, much longer, but I thought it was an interesting avenue to explore. I want to end, though, because I know you're busy, by extor- uh, exploring what you think are the major contemporary challenges to sexual expression. In your book, you clearly state that broadcast new technologies um, are among the highest cha- uh among the places we need to look most fervently to find challenges to sexual expression. But you also talk about funding to the arts. Right. So I, I think that there are um, now in particular uh, uh, great concerns about how um, arts funding will operate, uh, if there is any arts funding in the future, which is in question at the moment. Um, but the issue of, of to what extent the government, when it does fund the arts, uh, can draw distinctions uh, based upon the nature of the expression, and to say, for example, that we uh, will fund certain types of, of arts and not others. So one thing we know the government's not allowed to do is to make viewpoint-based distinctions when it funds the arts. So it can't, for example, say uh, we will fund uh, only artists um, who uh, support Donald Trump, but not those who criticize Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, that, the court has made clear, would be unconstitutional. 
Um, a, a more interesting question would be whether the government can uh, decline to fund work that is protected by the First Amendment, uh, but that is sexually explicit. So even if it was not obscene, uh, could it say we are not going to fund any art that shows nudity? Right? Would that be constitutionally permissible? Right? It's not an obscenity issue because the government's not trying to prohibit people from creating that art. It's saying that we can pick, we can pick and choose what kinds of art we will support. So, for example, the government this would be a content based restriction. Content based. So the government could say, for example, we're going to fund um, uh, 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 people who write books about history and not novelists, right? And most people would say, okay, that's that's not a problem. That doesn't violate the First Amendment, right? Um, or we're going to fund people who write books about um, 20th century history, not 19th century history. Right? It's a content-based rule, but we would probably say that's okay. Or a library could probably say, we're gonna, I'm going to create a library, but it has to be a library only about science. Right? And that would be okay. So the question is, how, do, how does nudity fit into that? Right? How does sex fit into that? Right? So can the government adopt a rule that says, we will fund artists, but, but not if they are going to do any art that includes nudity? Right? Is that like the historian versus the non-historian? Or is that in some ways more like the, the pro-Trump versus the not pro-Trump? Um, and that can be argued either way, frankly. But that is an issue, I think, that, that lurks in the background and that the courts never directly addressed. It has suggested, for example, that in, um, in public school libraries um, that the government can decline to include books uh, that would be seen as vulgar for children, right? Much broader than obscene. Um, and, uh, and, and probably they could do a similar thing for public libraries, depending on how you define vulgar. Um, and a similar argument would apply with respect to arts fundings. But this is a, a largely unexplored area of the law. But my guess is the court would, would, would say that uh, sexually explicit material does not have to be funded. Uh, that would be more like the historian, not historian, rather than like the pro-Trump versus non-Trump. But, but it's an unresolved question. Yeah, it's the morning of April 7th now, and Neil Gorsuch is expected to be... Uh, appointed to the to the Supreme Court later this morning. What do you see for the court on these issues after the Gorsuch appointment? Well, with Gorsuch ultimately replacing Scalia, I don't see any change on in the court's behavior to this broad range of issues, including abortion and gay rights and, and contraception and so on, as well as obscenity. Um, I don't think Gorsuch will be any different from Scalia on these issues. Um, he will be quite different from Garland would have been, and therefore the, the, the real question is not and should not be Gorsuch versus Scalia, it's Gorsuch versus Garland, and that is a shift in the court to the right relative to what it would have been um, had Garland been confirmed, as he should have been. Um, but the real critical question will now come if um, one of the more liberal justices on the court on these issues, Kennedy, uh, Breyer, or Ginsburg, um, who the three eldest justices, should leave the court and Trump have another opportunity to appoint a justice. Um, and I do think that with uh, a fifth very conservative justice on the court, that across all of these issues, abortion, gay rights, transgender rights, um, and uh, issues involving sexual expression, uh, that we would then see a court that is much less supportive of these rights uh, than the one we've had um, up till now. And I think that that does pose a serious um, threat to uh, our freedoms across all of those areas. And by ending, by way of ending, what issues do you think the court will want to take up um, in the near future because of lower court differences? Again, we'll want to take up in this world in which we have another change after this one or just now? Uh, just now, after the Gorsuch appointment. I don't think it'll change at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that basically... Um, the court will, the conservatives will probably stay away from abortion issues because there's now a five-member majority to take a more or less pro-choice stance, as was recently demonstrated. Um, I think the conservatives will want to stay away from gay rights and transgender issues for the same reason. Um, and uh, I think they'll want to stay away from regulation of sexual expression issues for the same reason, because there are five members of the court who have made pretty clear in a series of cases on all those issues that they will take uh, generally uh, positions that, that defend the rights of Americans. 
Um, on the other hand, you're talking the, about Kennedy being the Kennedy, swing vote, and those, on all those issues, Kennedy yeah. is the swing vote on the more civil liberties side. Mm -hmm. um, I think, on the other hand, that the more liberal justices, uh, including Kennedy, on these issues, not others, mm -hmm. might be more interested in taking on, for example, the transgender issues, um, which they haven't yet addressed, because as long as they do have that five-member majority. Um, I think they would probably want to take up those issues because they're likely to take a position on them very different than the one that the hypothetical court that might come into existence in a couple of years would take on them, and uh, therefore they'd want to get that uh, that, that uh, underway. Other than that, um, I, I on don't On free expression that, issues, though, you see very little movement. On, on free ex expression issues relative to sexual expression, yes. I see, yeah. I think, the, I think where the law is at the present time is pretty much where the more liberal justices would like to see it be mm -hmm. and not where the conservative justices want to see it be. So I don't think they have any strong agenda to take up any issues on those questions right now. Okay. Well, Professor Stone, we'll leave it at that. Thanks again for coming on the show. And I encourage everyone to check out your book, Sex and the Constitution. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for the great work that FIRE does. And thank you. That was University of Chicago law professor Jeffrey R. Stone. And his book is Sex and the Constitution. The book is available right now wherever fine books are sold. If you're interested in learning more about Professor Stone and the University of Chicago's aforementioned report of the Committee on Freedom of Expression, please visit thefire.org. We have a litany of information about it on our website, including a list of all 17 schools that we know of that have adopted a version of the report. And if you're a student or faculty member who would like to work to pass a version of the report at your school, we at FIRE are more than eager to help. So please shoot us an email at fire at the fire.org. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you've enjoyed this episode, please, please, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.